Good morning and welcome to this public meeting of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Before we start, can I confirm that all the commissioners are here? Commissioner Feldman? I'm here, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Trumka? I'm here, good morning. Good morning, and Commissioner Boyle? And I am here as well. Thank you. This morning, CPSC staff will brief the commission on a draft supplemental notice of proposed rulemaking regarding information disclosure under Section 6B of the Consumer Product Safety Act or the 6B regulation. This proposal is a continuation of the work the Commission started in 2014 to update our Section 6B regulation. For those who are unfamiliar, Section 6B of the CPSC, which is our authorizing statute, places uh, strict restrictions on how and when CPSC can discuss and manufacture consumer products. Before the agency can tell the public about a dangerous product, we generally must negotiate with the manufacturer over what we say and when. This can prevent the CPSC from issuing timely warnings about dangerous consumer products and put Americans at risk. Uh, we're the only federal safety agency with such a statutory restriction. And while I believe the best solution would be Congress to step in and repeal the, the statute and put us on par with our sister safety agencies, as long as we have 6B in place and remains the law, the commission can and should do better to ensure that our regulations are as consumer friendly as possible and don't restrict us beyond what the statute requires. I look forward to working with my colleagues to review this package and make the proposal available for public comment. In a moment, I will turn this meeting over to staff so that they can brief us. Once they've completed the briefing, each commissioner will have 10 minutes to ask questions of staff, multiple rounds if necessary. As a reminder to my colleagues, if you have questions address the agency's legal authority or other legal advice, please hold them until the closed executive session has been requested to be held later in today following the public briefing. Briefing us today is Amy Polden, attorney in the Office of General Counsel. Also with us are Austin Schlick, General Counsel, Melissa Hanscher, Assistant, excuse me, Assistant uh, General Counsel, and Alberta Mills, Commission Secretary. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Ms. Colvin. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. My name is Amy Colvin, and I'm an attorney in the Office of the General Counsel in the Division of Federal Court Litigation. I will brief the Commission today on the draft supplemental notice of proposed rulemaking to update 16 CFR Part 1101 information disclosure under Section 6B of the Consumer Product Safety Act. Next slide. So Section 6B1 of the Consumer Product Safety Act states, prior to its public disclosure of any information obtained under this act or to be disclosed to the public in connection therewith, the commission, to the extent practicable, must provide manufacturers or private labelers with advance notice and a reasonable opportunity to submit comments on the proposed disclosure, if the manner in which such consumer product is to be designated or described in such information will permit the public to ascertain readily the identity of such manufacturer or private labeler. And section three of the Consumer Product Safety Act defines manufacturer to include an importer. Next slide. Section 6B1 of the CPSA requires the Commission to take reasonable steps to assure that the information the Commission intends to disclose is accurate and that such disclosure is fair in the circumstances and reasonably related to effectuating the purposes of this Act. Next slide. In disclosing any information under Section 6B, the Commissioner may, and upon the request of the manufacturer or private labeler shall, Include with the disclosure any comments or other information or summary thereof submitted by such manufacturer or private labeler to the extent permitted by and subject to the requirements of Section 6. So that was an overview of the requirements under Section 6B1 of the CPSA. In the next slide, um, I'll talk about the updates that the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act made. So next slide. The Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act of 2008 amended Section 6 of the Consumer Product Safety Act. First, it shortened from 30 to 15 days the total period for manufacturers and private labelers to have notice, to receive notice and have an opportunity to comment on information the Commission proposed to disclose. 
Second, SIPSIA eliminated the requirement that the commission publish a federal register notice when the commission makes a public health and safety finding to shorten the time for providing notice. And finally, SIPSIA broadened the statutory exceptions to section 6B. Next slide. So the commission published a final rule interpreting section 6B in December of 1983. In November of 2008, the commission published a final rule amending the 6B regulation to reflect the SIPC amendments. And in February 2014, the commission published a notice of proposed rulemaking to amend the 6B regulation. The 2014 MPR was based upon principles contained in the commission's fiscal year 2013 mid-year review and operating plan adjustments. The 2014 MPR proposed to modernize the 6B regulation to account for the significant improvements in information technology that had occurred since the regulation's initial adoption in 1983. The 2014 MPR also proposed to streamline the regulation to align it more closely with the text of Section 6B, including with respect to re protect protecting information filed by firms under Section 15B of the CPSA. The Commission received 24 comments from the public on the 2014 MPR. Next slide. The draft supplemental MPR retains many revisions that were originally proposed in the 2014 MPR with small or no change. It also supplements the 2014 MPR based upon comments that we received and or to further, further modernize and more precisely align the 6B regulation with the statute. Finally, the draft supplemental MPR responds to comments on the 2014 MPR. So the next set of slides will, be, will provide a brief overview of some of the proposed revisions. Um, next slide. So the first set of revisions appear at section 1101.11b, where the draft supplemental MPR proposes to add three categories to the list of information that is not subject to the requirements of section 6b1 because it does not constitute a disclosure to the public. These categories were initially proposed in the 2014 MPR and based upon comments that we had received, the draft supplemental MPR proposes some minor revisions to some of the categories and also provides examples for clarity. The first category that the draft supplemental proposes to add to 1101.11b concerns reports of harm that are posted on the publicly available consumer product safety information database, which is otherwise known as saferproducts.gov. So section 6A F1 of the Consumer Product Safety Act specifically excludes reports of harm from the provisions of section 6B. And under the draft supplemental NPR's proposed ap approach, the commission may release or identify information contained in a report of harm that is provided that is posted to saferproducts.gov without providing notice under 6B1 if the commission does not characterize the information contained in the report and the commission's use of the information is accurate and not misleading. So for example, the commission could state that saferproducts.gov received 15 reports involving a particular manufacturer's lamp but the commission would have to provide 6B notice and opportunity to comment. If that same release then also warned consumers to stop using the lamp because of a hazard or contained other information that would constitute a public disclosure for which 6B1 notice would be required. The supplemental NPR also explains that the commission will continue to provide 6B notice before disclosing reports of harm that are not posted on saferproducts.gov. Next slide. The second category of information that the supplemental NPR proposes to add to 1101.11b involves information that the commission has already disclosed in accordance with section 6b1. This was initially proposed in 2014. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I'm talking, sorry, let me go back and talk about publicly available information. This, the second category of information is um, publicly available information. So commenters noted that publicly available information may be misleading or inaccurate or biased and that the commission's reference to that information could imply that the information is verified or accurate. So the draft supplemental NPR proposes a modified approach based upon the comments that we received. And so under this proposal, 
the commission may release or identify information that is available to the public, provided one, the commission clearly indicates the source of the information, two, the commission does not characterize or relay new information, and three, the commission's use of the information is accurate and not misleading. So, for example, the commission could state that it is aware of a particular newspaper article that references 15 reports involving a particular manufacturer's stroller. Provided the commission credits the source, um, it is reasonable to attribute integrity to the newspaper. For example, the newspaper follows journalistic standards and the commission's description of the newspaper's report is accurate and not misleading. And then the final category of information that we propose to add is information that was not previously disclosed that in context does not disclose materially more or materially different information about a consumer product than what the commission previously disclosed. So this approach simply expands upon the commission's current practice of disclosing a summary of a press release that was initially issued in accordance with section 6B1. So here, for example, a commissioner could relate in a speech the findings regarding manufacturer A's blender that appears in a CPSC staff report that was previously subject to section 6B1 and posted to our website. But the commissioner could not discuss other staff findings that are not in that report unless the commission had already provided the firm with notice and an opportunity to comment. Next slide. The 2014 MPR proposed requiring that the commission communicate electronically with firms in providing 6B notices. Commenters overwhelmingly supported this proposal, but they did see clarification in some of the procedures that we would use. So the draft supplemental NPR continues to propose that to the extent practicable, the commission will use electronic transmission of 6B notices to avoid delays inherent in other methods. In response to comments, the supplemental NPR clarifies that if electronic transmission is not tr practicable or the commission cannot confirm electronic receipt of the notice, we will use take appropriate steps to provide notice using other means, including delivery via U.S. mail. Next slide. Um, the draft supplemental NPR proposes two changes, changes with respect to firms' comments. So section 6B1 requires the commission to include with its disclosure of firm's comments or other information or summary thereof only if the firm requests inclusion and such, such inclusion is permitted by and subject to the requirements of section 6. The 6B regulation currently, however, requires the commission to disclose comments that a firm submits in response to a section 6B1 notice, even when the firm does not request disclosure. So the draft supplemental NPR proposes to conform the regulation to the statute. It also requires that any requests for withholding must be made in writing. Next slide. The 2014 NPR proposed requiring the manufacturer or private labeler to provide a legal rationale, such as a statute or regulation, to support withholding its comments. Because disclosure when it's not requested by a firm generally would become discretionary for the CPSC, the draft supplemental NPR instead proposes that the firm must explain any request for non-disclosure. Um, next slide. So section 6B1 requires the commission to provide notice to the extent practicable. There, the current regulation at 1101.26b provides examples of instances where it not be um, practicable for the commission to provide 6B notice. The draft supplemental NPR proposes to add two additional examples to the regulation. And this is a new proposed revision that did not appear in the 2014 NPR. The first example is when the commission has been unable after a diligent search to obtain the contact information for the manufacturer or private labeler of the consumer product to which the information pertains. And here, this um, example kind of just represents what happens now. Commission staff conducts um, searches in internal databases and other sources to, to find the contact information for a particular firm. But there have been occasions where staff has been unable to provide or to find the contact information. And in those instances, the commission has been unable to provide notice. 
The second example is when an extraordinary circumstance necessitates the immediate disclosure of information to protect the public health and safety, while the Commission simultaneously pursues notification of the manufacturer or private labeler. So, for example, on a holiday weekend, the Commission might become aware of a serious hazard involving a new consumer product that is associated with the holiday, and the Commission attempts to contact the manufacturer without any success. In this instance, the Commission could go out with the disclosure and, to, and immediately notify the public of the hazard, but also wait for a response for the firm. Importantly, how, um, I just wanted to note that the Commission would still take reasonable steps to assure that the information it intends to disclose is accurate and that disclosure is fair in the circumstances and reasonably related to effectuating the purposes of the Act. Next slide. So this is a new proposed revision that did not appear in the 2014 MPR. Section 6B1 requires the Commission to take reasonable steps to assure prior to disclosing information that the information is accurate. The draft supplemental MPR proposes to add as another reasonable step the Commission could take to assure accuracy. Um, instances when the Commission staff relies on a statement made under oath or a similar statement enforceable under penalty of perjury, such as a sworn affidavit, that yields or corroborates the information to be disclosed. Next slide. The next um, revision involves attorney work so a product and attorney client privilege information. This revision was proposed in the 2014 MPR. Um, so in general, section 6B1 requires the commission to take reasonable steps to assure that disclosure is fair in the circumstances. The regulation currently at 1101.33B3 provides um, examples of disclosure, disclosures that generally would not be fair in the circumstances. So the supplemental NPR proposes to delete the current example of releasing legally privileged information that has been provided to the commission intentionally. We believe that firms waive privilege when they provide legally privileged material, material intentionally to the commission. But if a firm inadvertently provide, submits privileged information, we will treat that information in accordance with inadvertent disclosure. Next slide. The final set of changes involves information contained in the Section 15B report. So, in addition to the requirements of Section 6B1, Section 6B5 of the Consumer Product Safety Act imposes further disclosure limitations on information submitted pursuant to Section 15B unless certain exceptions apply. The current regulation at 1101.63 states Section 6B5 does not apply to information independently obtained or prepared by the Commission staff. The draft supplemental notice of proposed rulemaking proposes two revisions to this section at 1101.63 which we propose to designate as 1101.63b. Next slide. So the proposal, proposal states, section 6b5 does not apply to information independently obtained or prepared, which is language current, that is in the current regulation. And here's the new language, or developed through subsequent investigation and verification by the commission, any member of the commission, or any employee agent or representative, including contractor of the commission in a official capacity. And so this, this is a new proposed change that did not appear in the 2014 MPR. And this change simply reflects current practice and recognizes that information that may appear in a 15B report, such as, such as contact information for consumers who report incidents to a firm, or the names of retailers and distributors that the commission can contact those consumers to obtain additional information about the incidents or contact the retailer to obtain additional information about a product that the retailer sells, even when the underlying information appears in a 15B report. Next change, next slide, I mean. So this is, um, this is a, a change that was initially proposed in the 2014 MPR, and we made slight adjustments. Um, so section 6B5 does not apply to information that is already available to the public, including but not limited to information appearing in a company's press statements, websites, FAQs, product user manuals, sales materials, SEC filings, or other public statements or documents. And so 
This is just to represent that section 65's additional limitation on disclosure of 15 B information does not apply to information that is already available to the public, such as the price of a particular consumer product, which the public can find by walking into a retail store or conducting a search online, or the sizes or colors of a particular product, which could be found simply by looking at a retail display. But depending on the information proposed for disclosure, um, Section 6B1 notice may apply. So that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ms. Bolton. I appreciate that. Um, appreciate the presentation as well. At this point in time, we're going to turn to questions from the commissioners. As I mentioned, we'll be 10 minute rounds, multiple rounds uh, if necessary. Uh, I'm going to start with myself. Um, so, under the proposed revisions, information that's already been made available to the public through sources other than the commission, like the press or so. Uh, it's not covered by 6B as long as the commission indicates the sources of the information and the commission's use of the information is accurate and not misleading. How does this type of uh, proposed revision address concerns that this type of information should be covered by 6B? Sure. So Congress applied the 6B procedures only to the commission's public disclosure of information. So Public disclosure just by definition includes only kind of material that is newly available that that we are releasing and it's um, we're making known something that was previously unknown. And so when we view public information, we don't consider it to constitute a public disclosure under the act because we are not presenting new information. It's already out to the public, but. We do recognize that there could be fairness issues, in particular those issues raised by commenters, that information that's publicly available could be misleading or inaccurate. And so the draft supplemental NPR provides other protections to ensure fairness. First, um, the source of the repeated information must be identified. So the name of the newspaper or the scientific journal. Second, the commission must provide the information itself without characterizing it or adding any kind of additional information that would constitute a disclosure and trigger the requirements under section 6B. And then finally, the reference, the commission's reference to the information must be accurate and not misleading. So a follow up to that, and then how do you assess the argument that the commission's repetition of information that's already in the public domain somehow fundamentally changes the nature of the information and so CPSC is legally required to go through a 6 B process? Right, so we, when- uh, Ms. I'm, I'm sorry, Ms. Jenny, I, 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 Ms. Cullen has been careful to give uh, her answer to your last question in terms of what's already in the document and, and now we're probably crossing over into an assessment of legal arguments that might that might be made by commenters. So if we'd save that for a closed session, please. Okay. Um, one minute. Um, so, uh, Ms. Coleman, can, can you explain the origin of the proposal that the release of public information should be accurate and not misleading and how that might work in practice then? Sure. So, when we were considering referencing publicly available information, we looked at Section 687 of the Consumer Product Safety Act. And this section contains the retraction requirements. So, it requires the commission to publish a retraction of inaccurate or misleading public disclosures. And while section 6A7 doesn't technically apply, if we're just pointing to information that's publicly available because it's not a public disclosure, the principles in section 6A7 certainly are, should be considered guiding principles to both the commission and staff that you know, the accuracy of the information that the commission um, that the information the commission releases is accurate and that we um, avoid misleading the public. So the draft would um, require each commissioner and commission staff to look at the standard in 6A7 and ensure that they, when they release information that is publicly available, that their use of the information is accurate and not misleading. And OGC would certainly be available to assist in any assessment and to provide any guidance. Um, so will the pros 
changes affect the uh, commission's treatment of confidential commercial information or financial information? No, absolutely not. Um, Section 6A of the CPSA still applies and has very strict requirements on the commission's disclosure of any confidential commercial or financial information or trade secret information. Firms are still um, able to submit comments that contain that information or to comment on proposed disclosures and claim that the information that the commission intends to disclose or the information or comments contain confidential commercial or financial information. Um, they just need to submit the claims in accordance with the commission's FOIA requirements and the FOIA regulations, specifically at 1015.18. Okay. Well, thank you, Ms. Coleman. I'm, I'm going to reserve the rest of my time and, and defer to the other commissioners at this point in time. Commissioner Feldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Ms. Colvin and uh, Mr. Schlick, our general counsel, for all the work that's gone into this uh, and, and for the, the presentation today. I know that this is something that's been on the uh, agency's books as a pending rulemaking since as early as 2014, um, and I'm glad that we have the opportunity to talk about it today. Um, Ms. Colvin, I did have a couple of questions that I, I did want to raise. Um, you know, when we're talking about the disclosure of information that's already publicly available, when we're talking about disclosing uh, uh, media reports that are that are already sort of out there and published, um, it, it would seem to me that the commission's disclosure and distribution of, of that information necessarily involves some sort of assessment on, on our end of uh, the the integrity of those media reports. And is that accurate? Is that an assessment that we would have to make? Well, right. There's, um, we would certainly look at the integrity of the source. So, for example, does the newspaper follow journalistic standards? Does the scientific journal, do they have um, a peer review requirement? So we would certainly definitely consider that in determining whether or not we could point to a particular publicly available information. Okay. I mean, in other contexts, we've relied on studies that haven't been peer reviewed, but we're talking about a different context, right? I mean, we would just look at the, the the standards that the particular publication uses. So you're right. I w I shouldn't say that it needs to be peer reviewed, but we would definitely. Okay. I, th that 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 that's concerning to me. I I I I appreciate you give, putting a little bit more meat on the bones of how we would sort of begin the process of assessing the integrity of a particular media outlet. But that sounds awfully close to content moderation. And that's that's not something that we have much experience with, nor is that it's a very dangerous road to, to go down. I think that gives me a, a significant amount of pause. Um, but but for more than that, uh, it, it's troubling to me, you know, whenever we put information out from a particular source, uh, the proposition that that stands for uh, almost certainly is going to be sort of attributed back to CPSC as, as, as our own. How, how do we go about avoiding that? So the um, proposal states that we would first point to the source of the information and clearly indicate the source. We would not provide any kind of characterization of the information or provide any new information that would constitute a disclosure. And then we would make sure that our use of the information is accurate, mislead, not misleading. So, for example, we could state the New England Journal of Medicine just published a report on manufacturer A's product. Okay. And then, it, yeah, it, it's it's not a hypothetical concern, though. Um, you know, recently and under prior leadership, uh, our Office of Communication published uh, recommendations, uh, for example, on how deep to bury beach umbrellas. Um, we took information that came from an outside source. It was the uh, a community publication in uh, uh, Ocean City, Maryland, um, that made the recommendation of burying a beach umbrella two feet. We we published that. There's no independent CPSC testing, um, but we sort of regurgitated a, 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 a media information that was already publicly available, um, and then on multiple occasions watching this story and this recommendation get re re regurgitated, uh, this two feet recommendation was parroted back as if it were a CPSC recommendation and it wasn't. It was from a, a community newspaper in, in Ocean City, Maryland. Um, 
So again, not a hypothetical concern. It's a real concern. Uh, and it's a, a concern that, that I have. And I, I think I'm glad that we're putting this out for publication uh, because this will be an opportunity for us to, to, to receive comments about uh, how best to proceed on this front. I did have one other question and I wanna be mindful of the time. Um, in uh, the, the presentation, uh, you talked about uh, uh, instances where, they're, they're, uh, where, where notice and comment isn't practicable. So this would be uh, staff's proposals to expand 16 CFR 1101.26B. Uh, um, and the staff proposal, as I understand it, would uh, allow the commission um, you know, to act in extraordinary circumstances that would necessitate immediate disclosure of information to protect public health and safety. Um, while the commission simultaneously pursues notification to the manufacturer or uh, or the private labeler. Uh, my question uh, to you would be, who makes the call about what, what constitutes an extraordinary circumstance? Would this be uh, sort of delegated to staff to, to pursue that, or is that a, a call for the, the commission to make? You know, that's a really good question that I don't have the answer to, but I'm happy to get back to you on that. I appreciate that, uh, Ms. Colvin. Thank you very much. I may have additional questions, uh, but for the time being, I'm going to yield to my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Trumka. Thank you. Um, so, like, the gag rule puts inappropriate and dangerous restrictions on the agency's ability to timely share critical information on safety with the public. And, and people can be hurt and killed as a result of this inappropriate statutory burden. I know that Congress is considering the Sunshine and Product Safety Act to correct this, and I hope it passes. Uh, but this agency, I think what we're recognizing today is that the agency's also historically put additional burdens on ourselves, on our ability to communicate through overly restrictive interpretations of the act. And I agree that we should change that um, wherever that's appropriate. I'm not sure we go as far as we need to with this proposal, uh, and so I would love to hear great ideas through a robust comment process. I, I do have a, just a couple of specific questions on the proposal. Uh, so in, in the proposed draft section 1101.11A3 would read, the information must be obtained, generated, or received under the acts to be disclosed to the public in connection therewith. Does the word generated appear anywhere in the statute? Yeah, the word generated does not appear in the statute. Okay. And then in 1101.11b5 and b6, we exempt certain information from 6b1 requirements, specifically a report of harm on saferproducts.gov and information that has already been made available to the public through sources other than the commission, provided that we clearly indicate the source of the information and the commission's use of information is accurate and not misleading as, as you just went over how that process would work. Uh, but in the preamble, I think we create some ambiguity in how we describe those exemptions. Preamble states that we can release information without 61 notice as long as, quote, one, the commission does not characterize the information contained in the report, and two, the commission's use of the information is accurate and not misleading. We already have an obligation under 6B6 and, and 6B7 to not release information that is inaccurate or misleading. But the part about the not characterizing the information could be an issue as it's undefined, and I think that could be broadly interpreted. Does the word characterize appear in the statute? No, it does not appear in the statute. I think to remove some ambiguity there and, uh, and retain our ability to put information in proper context when we talk about it, we may need to change to that characterization part of the proposal to add some clarity, and, and hopefully we can discuss that through the comment process. Um, last question that I have here, for, for fairness, we allow firms to include their comments. We give them the opportunity to provide their comments alongside ours when we release certain information. Uh, many times they want to do that. You know, they want to be able to explain or put things in their own context. But in this package, we devote a lot of attention to the idea of firms objecting to their own comments being released with our release. How often do we find firms objecting to their own words being made public? I don't have um, specific data, but in my experience, and this is just my experience reviewing comment letters, the majority of firms request that their comments be withheld. And do what kinds of issues do they raise uh, as to, to justify not wanting them to be released? 
typically firms will state that their comments contain confidential commercial or financial information that is protected under section 6A2 and the commission's FOIA regulation. They also claim that release of the information would violate section 6B1 because, for example, they provided information um, in connection with settlement negotiations. And so they would object to the release of that information. Is it ever that they would just simply be embarrassed by some of the arguments they make to try to keep their statements private? I have never experienced that or seen that in my review. I uh, have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Boyle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you to the staff who worked on this um, package. Um, I actually don't have questions. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, take a fresh look at the regulation in light of the need to modernize and in modern communications. I think it's a good idea that we do so, and I am looking forward to the robust uh, comment period uh, that I am anticipating. So I appreciate the work and uh, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, we can go to a second round of questions if anybody has any. Commissioner Feldman, uh, well, Thank you, Mr. yes, I don't have any, so I'll go to Commissioner Feldman. Thank you. Um, Ms. Colvin, we heard some discussion today about the, the importance and the need using information publicly to put that information in the proper context. Um, and I understand why that's, that's important because uh, it serves consumers better to have actionable information that's appropriately contextualized. But at the same time, with what I'm reading in staff's proposal, which is talking about, uh, you know, putting out information, you know, within the, 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 the what's allowable under 6B uh, that, that's already publicly available, um, that in order to, to, to do that permissibly, that we would need to uh, keep that sort of without without putting any additional context on it, without sort of comment from the agency. So any any thoughts from you or, or, or guidance? How do we put information in the proper context, but at the same time, make sure that we're not adding, you know, any sort of a, 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 a additional commentary or, or, or uh, uh, thoughts from the agency characterizing that information one way or the other? So um, I think- Those two things <laughs> seem contradictory. I think I look at it at two ways. First, um, if we're simply referencing or, or responding to a reporter's inquiry, did you see Newspaper X's article on this particular product? And we acknowledge, yes, we are aware of this article on manufacturer A stroller. That in that context, that is not that cannot constitute a public disclosure. So section six B and the requirements wouldn't apply because we are not. Why wouldn't that be a public material. disclosure? Okay. Because the definition of, you know, disclosure or public disclosure is really releasing new material that was previously unknown. And so if we're acknowledging that there is a newspaper article out there. That's information that it's already out there and the public is aware of it. So I, that's my kind of the, my first response. The second is just framing it and to make sure that we are providing accurate and not misleading information is the steps that we will take to first make sure that people understand we are not the source of the information. We are aware there is this New England Journal of Medical Study, um, or sorry, New England Journal of Medicine Study, and the commission is aware of it. Um, number two, we don't say anything about the information contained in the report. We don't kind of, pre we don't provide our own interpretation or explanation of the information. And number three, we don't provide new information. So for example, we would not be able to state, here's this um, newspaper's article about 40 incidents involving a particular manufacturer's bike. And by the way, the commission is aware of an additional 50 incidents. In that instance, that is new information that we are proposing to, and I won't use the word disclose, that would require 61 notice and opportunity to comment. I, I'm, I'm curious then why, why would this would be drafted so narrowly uh, that, that we would be responding just to, to, to you know, newspaper articles that we've, that we've put out. But uh, putting that aside, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious also 
how this plays out when the commission puts out a, a release with, with, with the kind of information that we're talking about today. Um, you know, if we put out a press release character or uh, uh, sort of stating with no additional information what we're learning in a, a particular article that's that's out there or a medical journal or, or what have you, in 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 my experience in in, in communications, that's almost certainly going to generate a, a significant amount of public and, and media inquiries about sort of the nature of the statement, why we why we made that statement, what we believe it to mean. Um, you know, what would the guidance be, uh, and I'm not necessarily looking for legal guidance, but but how does this play out? How, how would our Office of Communications handle um, you know, the, the, the media inquiries that are almost certainly going to follow? What, 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 what restrictions would they be under? Well, I think that they could state, for example, if there is a huge report on a great increase in number of incidents involving a particular firm's product, this would be a way for the commission and in particular the Office of Communications to state consumers go go to saferproducts.gov and please report your incidents without saying anything else. And that way we have the message out that if there's an incident, if you've experienced an incident, please report it on saferproducts.gov. And I think that's what we've been doing already and that's kind of consistent communication and messaging that the commission does right now. I think that makes sense when when we have an OCM that's staffed by uh, competent communications professionals, and I've got a great deal of faith in the team that we currently have in place right now. But that that hasn't always been the case. Uh, so you know, when you've got a, 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 a director of communications that that is a, a professional and disciplined um, and, and able to stay on message. Uh, in situations where, where that's not the case, which we've experienced at this agency, I think that's where I have some concerns. So again, I think this is a, I'm glad that we're putting this out for comment. Um, I'm, 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 I'd be curious to see uh, uh, how the public responds uh, to those concerns in particular. I have no further questions, but again, I wanna thank you for the work that you put into this and thank you for the presentation today. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Trunka, did you want a second round? Uh, no, I'm I'm set. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Boyle. No, thank you. Thank you. Thanks to uh, the staff for this informative briefing and to all the commissioners for their active participation. We look forward to uh, hearing from the public and putting this out for for notice as well. Uh, with that, this briefing is adjourned. Thank you.